So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a huge discount off your Nord VPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a cricketer protects its nether region with NordVPN today. Can I have your name and job title, please? Hi, um, I'm Srinath. Uh, I host a podcast called Conversations at the Cow Corner with a friend of mine uh, who goes by Samba. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for having me, Jared. No worries. Thanks. Thanks for being on. Uh, you're basically on to talk about something that I've been writing about for a couple of years, but I don't think people have quite fully understood it or grasped it yet, which is that there is a great franchise logjam, um, essentially at, uh, around Christmas and new year, that sort of period where you have the big bash, you have the super smash, you have the SA 20, the ILT 20 and the Bangladesh premier league all on at the same time. And I think if you look historically, that's it kind of makes sense that this is the period that you're going to have it because the Southern Hemisphere specifically always plays cricket around this time. It probably, yep. my guess is if you were looking at Google al algorithms, that it would look quite good around the, this time of the year um, uh, for cricket, just because people are generally excited about it. Quite often, you know, some some workplaces around the world won't be working at this time, so you can watch more cricket. And there's summer holidays down south, and all these different things that are happening at the same time. But it is very, very. It is becoming very, very clear that this is an untenable situation for all these different leagues to all be overlapping each other. Yeah. Um... I started looking into this because I, I became incredibly interested in uh, how all of the, fran the franchise model is kind of taken over cricket. Um, my understanding of these franchises uh, come from basketball. I'm a big basketball guy. And of course, like growing up in India, like I just loved and played cricket every day. So when I sort of put these two together, like the the how much the franchise cricket was kind of taken off was super interesting to me. And I wanted to try and figure out how this was going to evolve over the next bunch of years. Hmm. And um, you know, when I started to look at, um, you know, what are all the different leagues? When do they happen? And I mapped it out on a calendar. And it was, uh, I was shocked uh, to see that, like, you know, around this time, between end of uh, early to mid-December to end of Jan, there's five tournaments that happen. And the more I kept going deeper in, the more bizarre it was uh, with people leaving one tournament in the middle to play another tournament. Last year, Rashid Khan did something completely like unexpected. He left, or rather, uh, his team lost the SA T20. He ballooned into the IL T20 semifinals and the finals alone. And he was able to play the semifinals and the finals for the Mumbai Indians franchise in the IL T20. And all of this, like, you know, got me thinking about uh, how are all of these going to continue to exist or what's going to happen? Is it is this logjam going to get cleared out in some way? And generally, those questions are answered uh, based on what I've seen in the NBA and the EPL based on finances. And therefore, like, I, I started to look a little bit more deeper into how much players get paid in each of these leagues. What is the average salary and things of that nature? And that's where my, you know, uh, the, the thread that I put out, uh, that, 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 that was the basis of it. Well, the interesting thing is that you came to this a little bit late because you missed the, the period when the BPL was quite big. So in Bangladesh, there was a period where they had private owners. And when I was working for big bash teams, the big issue was how did they get overseas players when the BPL is playing double the amount of money? And they kind of figured at the time that, it's the BPL and eventually players wouldn't want to be involved or there would be a fixing scandal or, you know, cause there was some, there was some real issues with the BPL at that time. And what actually happened was even more bizarre. It was that that really successful version of the BPL was ended um, over a squabble between the owners and the BCB. Um, and the BPL then started running itself again. And that is now just not an important league. It has gone from being arguably in that period, the most important league, to being by far away, uh, well, that New Zealand, the least important leagues. And so it had already happened before the SA20 and the ILT20, that's a stupid name, they've got to change that, um, uh, the ILT20 uh, came in. 
And so the fact that you then had everything else. So let's just start with this. The BPL and the ILT20, I would assume, do not actually need to be played at this time of year. Um, I would agree with uh, the Bangladesh Premier League. ILT20, I don't know. Uh, they're playing in Dubai. So they don't have a whole bunch of months that they can be outside to host an actual nice tournament. Uh in December and Jan, uh, all of Middle East has reasonably decent weather to be outside. Okay. Any other part of the year, there is no chance to be outside. But the Bangladesh Premier League, though, I really do not understand why they can't put it in any other part of the year. Like when I, you know, charted all of these like tournaments out, there's this huge chunk between late September to early December where it's completely empty. There are no tournaments happening. There's very little international like leagues, tournaments that happen at that time too, playing for country stuff. And I was like, oh, maybe there must be a reason why they don't host it at that time. Is it like a monsoon or something? And I put it, I checked it out and put it in my thread that the best two months of weather is October and November in Bangladesh. So Again, it's uh, head scratching to me why they would want to compete with these other four leagues. I mean, I didn't know the background of what you just said. It's good. I need to go and read up about it. But now that given that all these other four tournaments are fairly well established, the BPL does not, you know, need to fight with these when they have a clear like uh, October and November schedule that they could be hosting it in. I looked at the temperatures, you're right. I hadn't realized it was that stark. But yeah, I could see now ILT20 probably makes more sense. I think they could probably also play it in November um, or February. So there is some flexibility. But there is also a lack of flexibility because I my guess is why the Bangladesh League is at the time that it is at is because it's just be before the PSL um, and then that leads into the IPL. So all three of those are kind of stacked up in that way. And the ILT20, I think they probably would, again, like to play it in that nice period where it's not too far away from the IPL, but is not directly perhaps also up against the PSL, which could be a league that could, could at least, um, you know, uh, match some of their, their wages going ahead. So that's the other interesting thing is that the PSL and the IPL come right after all these things as well. There are ways around all this, right? Um, I'm not sure the ILT20 had to exist, but that's a whole whole different point. You talk. I mean, I I I think uh, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, the uh, the Vision Fund, how, whatever entity we want to talk about, these guys are getting real serious about cricket. That that much is to me extremely uh, clear based on. The trail of evidence or the trail of breadcrumbs yeah, that we've but seen. I think that's more the Saudi guys. I think if you look at the people who are financing the Middle East comp, uh, sorry, the um, Dubai competition, it's actually more just traditional cricket people, right? So it's not it's not as if it is, and and, and they're never going to get massive crowds. Um, in fact, I talked to a friend the other day. I think they have other issues there with, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 the. The fact that it's up against a, another big league in the SA20, so they can't automatically be the big league. This is about, just so you know, I, I think this is about the third or fourth major attempt to have a big UAE competition. So there was the old XT20, I think it was called, or T20X. Um, there was the Emirates Premier League, and there was a couple of others that did never even made it. Right. So people keep pushing this. I still don't see the long-term sustainability of this unless you're using it as a area to develop overseas players for the IPL or coaching staff. But if you have the SA20 going on at the same time, aren't you already splitting some of your resources there? It, so I don't understand that. But let's leave that for a minute because you, you had a really interesting thing. You talked about Bangladesh um, potentially having an IPL team, right? Which is, that's going back to the old ICL days. Um, talk me through that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, again, uh, my inspiration comes from uh, the NBA, uh, where when uh, the reason why the Indian Premier League, you know, sort of makes sense now is in some way, loosely, all of these cities are inside the Indian border. Yep. And there you can fly to them within like another two to three hour flight and play a match there. If you can do that with places that are like, you know, relatively close by, I think it makes sense financially because you get in, I mean, when we're talking about Bangladesh, we're talking about, you know, uh, another 250 million people. Mm -hmm. It's no joke to, you don't get like that kind of audience all of a sudden for, uh, you know, a league that you're like already running. So 
that's a win and for the bangladesh premier league they get to see the best product out there as well like or rather the indian premier league's team in bangladesh that get to see the best product out there as well so uh this is like i said inspired by having the toronto raptors in the nba like they are relatively close if teams can fly from the west coast to toronto or uh vice versa so why not think of having a team in bangladesh and having a team in sri lanka if that's needed and i would even go further because dubai is a two and a half hour flight from bombay so if we're talking expansion and actually bringing in some real money in like i would love to see like what other options there are instead of just like you know uh, figuring out what other indian cities how can you go much more wider to get a much bigger audience into the ipl so i've got a slightly different plan that i've written about even years ago before this whole log jam began which was the B- bangladesh don't need a premier league sri lanka don't need a premier league right the only why country- why why well why? i'll explain why in a second but the only country that needs a premier league is pakistan right because they're the only country that can eventually actually make lot, quite a lot of money from um from cricket the way that the country is set up and and the amount of people and everything that that live there but a super asian league where you have six teams in pakistan and you have two teams in sri lanka and you have two teams in bangladesh and as you said i have a team in dubai eventually maybe a, a, a nepalese team you know maybe if oman get good you know you 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 keep doing that we have seen that with rugby union before hmm. uh you know we've seen that with champions league in, in europe for football and every other thing so to get back to my point of why those other leagues don't need a premier league they need a t20 league right that was sri lanka's big problem was not only did they not have a premier league they didn't even have like a proper t20 league right and so none of their players could develop and and it was an absolutely ridiculous situation they need a league why do they need all these overseas players in these slots would be my my question you want to find out who your best players are maybe you maybe you go back to a sort of an england style thing of having one or two overseas players so they can get some wrist spinners into bangladesh and you know uh, uh, you know some heavy hitters into sri lanka Wh- whatever you need to fill your sides out right but then from that competition you pick your players for the asian super league right and obviously pakistan is the major part of that you then have something that is never going to rival the ipl it's never going to be at that level but what it is is profitable right and so when a bangladesh team go to pakistan it is more than just a franchise playing another franchise even if it is that's all it is right there is a little bit of national identity um on the line in that so you're combining the best bits about cricket and the best bits about franchise sport all together you're also sharing costs the reason that the bangladesh premier league can't afford to pay these players massive amounts of money is because they're not generating massive amounts of money because their market doesn't allow for that at the moment it might one day to be fair to them but at the moment it doesn't right again you start having you start like you can't tell me you can't get someone like pepsi or you know a global company that's interested in all those different markets to be like wait a minute this is an absolute gold mine it increases the quality of that competition right across the board because pakistan suddenly don't have 8 or 10 teams they have 6 teams but their teams are really really strong all that money feeds down into your feeder leagues again that allows if you're an overseas player um that's quite interesting and if you're a team owner again I think that's a quite an interesting thing whereas if you're owning a Bangladesh team you're really waiting for the Bangladesh TV audience slash economy to get to the level where that makes money for you whereas if you do this it should actually be profitable far more early on plus the most important thing is it's a much better cricket product yeah i mean um i don't see a downside in doing that i actually like that idea a lot um I'm just trying to think uh this is like a bunch of different pieces that need to come together for this. Yeah. I can I tell you why uh, it won't they... work. It's cuz they all hate each other. But that's a separate argument. <laughs> you said it not I but uh, <laughs> but um but yeah this one's a uh, you know could be more tricky for it to come together cuz at the end it comes down to finances. Right? Like uh what kind of TV rights uh and the tv rights piece is not so straightforward because it's it's not the same channels in bangladesh as is in pakistan as is in sri lanka so what's the split there like how does all of this work so i think i, I think a big part get- of it is you need a streaming platform so you need a company who is going to buy the rights to stream it and then sell it off individually to the tv companies in in each country which is 
we're getting to a point when I came up with this idea five years ago, that was unfeasible. We're not that far away now from the Ambani family just going, well, we can own Sri Lankan cricket, major league cricket, ILT20, and we can own all the Asian cricket. Now they won't do that because it's um, a Pakistani or well, partly a Pakistani product. So they may not do it, but that doesn't mean that there won't be another entity who could come in and, and do that. But no, no, you're right. There are obstacles to it, but there's, Let's be honest. The Lankan Premier League is never going to be a major league, right? It no. just isn't. It's too the Lankan small. Premier league is, the Lankan Premier League is destined for failure. And I feel like the New Zealand smash is destined for failure. The Bangladesh Premier League might be destined for failure, but they have 250 million people. Yeah. So you never know. Maybe in the next five years, like, you know, things can really start looking up. So, but there are a whole bunch of these leagues that I just don't understand, like, how over the next three, five, seven years, when they start racking up losses, they're going to continue to like, you know, keep putting up their product. Well, let's go to Super Smash because that's the next one I think is really interesting. There is no reason why New Zealand teams are not in the Big Bash, right? Yeah, so, same thing, exactly, exactly. You talked about like, the NBA think, before. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but the NBL, the Australian basketball product, has New Zealand sides. You know, Rugby League, Rugby Union, there's already a natural thing. Now, don't get me wrong, Perth Scorchers to, um, uh, to play a team in Auckland, it's a bit of a trek. Right, it, it, yeah. it, you know it, it is, but they already do that in other sports, and I think that you can but, actually. But tell me do something: that. is is the NBL privately owned, or is it uh, owned by you know Rugby Australia or something like that? Uh, yeah. So I don't know much about the rugby actually. The NBL, I would assume, is I, I, I think, and I'm saying this correctly, I think is like the NBA, like it's an ownership group to do with the owners. Yeah, okay, because I I personally feel like this is the biggest blocker. From yeah. a team in New Zealand playing in the uh, BBL, I think they need to open it up. They need to make it private ownership. And if that happens, then like they're 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 going to figure out that the best way to get like the the finances to work is if there are a couple of teams in New Zealand, and you can like I don't know three five more million people watching. They they seem to be running a tournament anyway. So during that time, there's going to be cricket. There's going to be a much better product. More New Zealand players can play in Australia, vice versa, maybe. But it the New Zealand smash does not make sense at all. I was actually glad to see one highlight, which I don't know who took that catch, that but catch. it was a pretty <laughs> nice catch. But apart from that, I haven't seen anything about the New Zealand smash. Like, it might as well not exist. Like, no. I don't feel like anybody cares about it. <laughs> it. It was slightly more popular when it had the name Georgie Pie Super Smash, just because it had the name Georgie Pie Super Smash. Um, no, no, you're right. And I think... Again, so so this is where we get to the ownership. You could actually make an argument that South Africa, um, Australia, and New Zealand would be better off all together and then maybe have a Papua New Guinea team. But I'm not going to go that far at the moment because, you know, we just talked about the Asian version of that. But you, you could actually have a Southern Hemisphere competition because they're all sharing um, the same time zones and everything else. But the private ownership is really interesting. So, uh, you know, when the Big Bash was set up, it was set up at least in part to eventually go towards private ownership. The problem with private ownership, as BCCI have found a little bit, but certainly um, other, other countries have found, is that you then don't, if you're no longer the um, main paymaster of your players, uh, you, you get into huge issues. Now, the country that is like what like what i would i would actually like to like explore this a little bit because yeah i mean i i read a whole bunch about it saying uh the cricket australia does not want external factors like you know meddling in the long the um, you know long-term vision of the tournament and stuff like that i'm like really uh what could go wrong like what are the negatives of of getting like private ownership you australia have a series in january february um to be Mm -hmm. played um, and, well, actually that won't work particularly well here, but let's, okay. So let's say the Ambani's buy the Melbourne stars, right? Yes. That's kind of the team that the Ambani's would want to buy, right? So they buy the Melbourne stars, although they might want to buy a team that actually wins, but that's a whole different <laughs> argument. Um, they buy the Melbourne stars and at the moment, the Melbourne stars have, uh, let's say they have, I'm trying to think of a player who would, uh, let's say they had, um, Glenn Maxwell and Glenn Maxwell's back in the Australian test team. It's all this is unlikely, but let's just pretend that these things are happening. Right. And the Ambani said, well, we are paying you 
um, five hundred thousand dollars in this competition, and we are paying you one point five million dollars in this competition, and four hundred thousand dollars in this competition, and Cricket Australia is paying you one point five million. We want you to play for the Melbourne Stars, not for Australia during January. Well, this I don't think is an Australia specific problem. This no, is no, no, a it's not. systemic country versus franchise cricket problem. Yeah. So even if you know uh, they're Australia owns these BBL leagues. They're going to ditch Cricket Australia. They're going to ditch the BBL and maybe go play in the SA T20 because that pays 2.5x more than the BBL. But they're not like, at the moment. And there's a reason that they're not. And it's because Cricket Australia is their major paymaster. So outside of perhaps... David, right now. Yeah. Right now. Right now. No, no. But that's what I'm saying. So that's where they are at the moment. Cricket Australia paid Mitchell Stark not to play in the IPL, right? If there's another ownership group that comes in, they'll be able to do that. There's also, um, the, the, the next big issue is that the Big Bash is, it's the best way of putting it, it is an incredibly insular society, right? Cricket Australia completely run it like a local competition, right? If you bring in private owners, that all goes away. They cannot control anything about the Big Bash from that point forward. So SA20, the, the Cricket South Africa thought they could handle the owners and about two meetings in, they realized they had no control, right? Major League Cricket, similar kinds of issues, slightly different because in Major League Cricket, there's a few very powerful people on the other side in, in the American market. So there's a bit more give and take, but the exact same thing happened. Those owners came in, they just they were like, well, we're paying all this money. We're going to do it our way. Cricket Australia has not been, that's not how Cricket Australia plays. Remember, Cricket Australia didn't want Kerry Packer back in the day. They are naturally conservative organization. But I want to get to the other side of this. This is where it gets really, really tricky and why the IPL was very different. The IPL was set up as a franchise league for private ownership, right? So yep. we, we know that we know that the Ambani family. And I think, is it KKR and also now um, uh, Rajasthan Royals have all looked into buying um, county teams and everything, right? Yes. And, yes, and trying to get yes. 100 teams. So I, 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 I can't give you the full details because I'm not supposed to know all this. But essentially, there is a, there was an issue here that a lot of the county teams don't own the ground, right? And also, it, quite often, they are, you know, they're involved with the ground. Or uh, they have, so Middlesex, for instance, don't own Lords. They are allowed to play at Lords. And even, and so the London 100 side and Middlesex actually come into a bit of a clash as it is already when it comes to training facilities and everything else and, and availability with the ground. You throw in a franchise ownership of this and it gets even more tricky. That's not going to be a problem at Lords because I think if, if you have ownership of teams, the, uh, you know, Lords will buy, will buy their team. And that will be because they, they wanted to buy an IPL team in the, in the end of the day. But some of these other oh, places have that. this, right? Mm. And, and it's the same with, you know, the MCG. If, you, if the Ambani's want to buy the MCG, remember, the Boxing Day test still has to happen, right? The well, MC, but, MCG but, doesn't but, make money from cricket. It makes money from Aussie Rules football. And so there's all these little things that people don't, that, that are going to cause problems because... It's not a franchise situation. Whereas the BCCI basically just rented all the grounds from all the local boards and made it a little bit different. The CPL, exactly the same thing, right? It's actually a lot more technical and weird. So you've got those sorts of things. Then you have the politics of it, sure enough. Do rich English board members and Australian board members want to allow Asian people to come in and run their game in front of them? Well, now I think we're at the the actual point that we should have like started from the get go. <laughs> this this is the biggest like you know question. If you ask me, my theory on this is uh, there's going to be a capitulation at some point, and what I mean by capitulation is not letting India potentially run the 100 or the T20 Vitality Blast or the BBL, there's going to be a capitulation for private ownership to the tune of 49.9% or 49% or whatever the case may be. Because if they don't do that, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Mm. People are, I mean, uh, they reduced the tournament length by two and a half weeks. Why? I mean, it was spun nicely as a 
you know, oh, uh, it's already a long summer. We want to like, you know, make sure that uh, our audience are able to like, you know, um, be more present for the shorter, shorter number of matches. That's never the truth. Like you want to put out a product as long as possible so that you can continue to have like audience watching them as long as possible. These guys have clearly realized that they're unable to do that. Like players are leaving. Maybe even the uh, audience is watching something else. So they actually cut down the length of the league by two and a half weeks, reduce the overlap with the SAT20 and the uh, ILT20. Therefore, they could retain their most important stars, which is what everyone comes to see. Like, I mean, no offense, like if uh, Glenn Maxwell isn't playing, that's probably like two, three hundred thousand people that are probably not going to watch the BBL. They want to make sure that they have Glenn Maxwell. So I feel like if they want to continue to have this, they've got to go private ownership and get money in. But to the point you said initially, does Cricket Australia and the English Cricket Board want to have India meddling in their business? I feel like right now the answer to that is an absolute no, but they still want their money. I, I don't Which even is why think, I think... Yeah, I don't even think they want American ownership in. Or, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think it's, it's as much as, especially when it comes to Cricket Australia, they are so worried about all that sort of stuff that you know i don't even think they would want that but but you're right the, the indian element is is really important but i'll take it a step further the one thing that we haven't discussed is you can have a good domestic successful league that makes money and is profitable for you um, and subsidizes your international cricket or helps grow your international cricket and everything else at the same time right and so let's go back to bangladesh bangladesh could have a league that works in bangladesh it doesn't have, you know, when you were talking before about the Super Smash, you don't have to know about the Super Smash, right? What if the Super Smash can produce good players and makes money in New Zealand, that is working. And so, what England and Australia have to work out is after years of being the top dogs, are they willing to have highly successful domestic leagues that are just nowhere near the IPL um, and do that? The question, of course, then becomes eventually those leagues will become feeders for the IPL and nothing else. Farm and, systems, yes. Yeah. They're and absolute farm systems. And then it's a different political and, thing. And also, what if the IPL becomes eight months one day, which I think is very possible in the future, at least a six-month uh, league uh, length tournament. Then there's no time for your farm leagues, right? Yeah, which is why I'm, uh, I'm actually very surprised and slightly disappointed in the IPL. What are they waiting on? Like, I mean, I know, I think uh, 2027, the uh, uh, TV rights, like, uh, go over to the next, you know, set of, like, uh, uh, next contract. But I think by then, by that time, there is going to be a plan to extend it to at least another four or six teams. I would I would think it's a squandered opportunity if they don't do that. Because the more they, like, delay that, the more opportunities for all of these other leagues to figure out how they can work together or like come up with a product which can match with this. I think IPL can be the NBA, which just says, hey, I'm the top boss. You guys can all like play with each other and then figure out who your best are and then send them to me when it's time. Yeah, that's going to be the eventuality. I wish it'll come faster. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I th I've been I'm with you. I think that since Modi left, you know, there has been a real slowdown in their vision. Um, and, you know, if, 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 there, there's no reason why when you look at the Indian talent pool and when you look at the overseas talent pool that you can't, you can also do little things too. Like they could have an extra five or six teams and have an extra one or two international players for a little while. And, and, and I eventually think they won't need the overseas list. If you want to have, um, 11 overseas players in, in, in your team, um, and, and Mumbai want to have 11 Indian players in their team. All these things should be available and, and on the board uh, for those sorts of things. The, the local players will always get paid a premium. You see that with England footballers, right? You know, they, they still get paid a premium um, in their market. And, you know, there was a trade in the NBA last week for a player that wasn't particularly good but went back to Toronto to play because he's Canadian. Like, there's always... There's always that that sort of thing happens naturally. You see it in the Big Bash as well. Sometimes you know teams trying to drag their Melbourne stars back to Melbourne and everything like that, um, because it plays with your market. But the point being, I, I, I'm with you. I think it can be a lot bigger. I don't think though, knowing international cricket as well as I do, that 
there's any way anyone's going to come up with a league that is going to slow, uh, you know, to to mess with the uh, the IPL or slow it down. So you, maybe there is an argument, and and I'm being really optimistic here, but maybe there is an argument at one stage you have a joint European American league like in 20 years time and major league cricket and the hundred with a couple of teams in, you know, you're in the Netherlands at the moment, maybe, you know, maybe a joint Netherlands, Scotland's team or something like that, or an Island team. But even then, I just don't think that's where the future of cricket is going. The future of cricket is going towards Asia, which is why I think the only thing that would work would be an Asian league of some kind. But I know the politics of why that, and you talked about the business before, but just the politics and business, the obstacles there, it would need to be, a incredibly rich Indian family or a Pakistani family or Bangladeshi family who just comes in and goes, let's just do this and, and, and make it more relevant. So there's big issues there, but I do think just in general, there's no reason why the IPL isn't bigger. There was no reason. There was no reason for the last five years why there wasn't a women's IPL, right? Like they, they yeah, you know, right just about that. really basic things that they haven't got right. Um, and they do a lot of things right. They do understand their audience and everything else. But really basic things, we're just like, you could run this show. Why are you still pretending? Like, like when the BCCI used to go to meetings and go, oh, we don't want a window for the IPL. And I'm like, well, A, you're already creating a window for the IPL. And B, you should be saying, we want a four-month window for the IPL. No. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, um, I, I, I think the playbook for... How to have a successful league is out. Um, you know, private ownership is a key part of that playbook. If you don't do that, you're lagging behind. And first to market or first to own a time slot in the year, that's also a key part of the playbook. Mm. So the, these two things, the earlier you get done and the more foundational it gets, those are the leagues that are going to sustain. If you don't have private ownership and you don't have ownership of a particular slot in the year, you are at some point going to fade away. And which is why I think there's going to be a Southern version that eventually emerges. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm a big fan of cricket in Australia, but it, right now it looks like SAT20 is bigger in every way, at least in the way that players treat it because of the money there. So people from Australia are going there. It's an opportunity that Australia is just squandering. Just right in front of our eyes, they're just squandering this opportunity. I wish they would corner this, you know, Southern Hemisphere summer and make it their own. But right now they aren't. And then, of course, the, you know, March to uh, May timeframe, IPL owns it. And then the Northern Hemisphere kicks in after that with the T T20 Vitality Blast and... Uh, you know, the uh, 100 and things of this nature. CPL, Major League Cricket. I don't know cricket. if you knew, there's a whole bunch. Yeah, CPL and Major League Cricket. There's a whole bunch of feuding between the uh, um, the 100 and the T20 Vitality Blast because they're like, hey, with the two very similar tournaments, can we merge? And the 100 dude is like, to hell with you guys. I'm running my own product. Because the T20 Vitality Blast's viewership has been going down since the 100 started. Yeah. So there's going to be something happening between these two as well at some point. Like these, these two can't keep running themselves. Well, the hundred, all of the counties. The, yeah, the hundred really hasn't done that well. Like it's it, it, the problem with the hundred and the Big Bash is the same issue. And so I don't know if you know, but the Big Bash, uh, uh, the Big Bash was the template for the hundred, right? And and the issue, the issue for both of them is that lack of private um, ownership. And so, sure, but at least the hundred has a part of the year that they don't overlap with anybody else. Well, they overlap with themselves. The hundred is they, they overlap by with, the, with the blast. But you know, you're right. I, I think it has that, but I don't think the hundred is massively discussed in outside um, circles. And one of the reasons is that it, it doesn't have the it doesn't have a link to any other leagues, right? And um, you know, the it, it it's it's. It's going down that big bash route of being very successful local domestic product, but maybe without the high end. And the idea, of course, was that this was going to be the high end product. They already had a domestic product that was doing okay. They needed something a lot higher than that. My, my other question to you is like, but what's the end game for the South African League? Because you say it's bigger than a big bash at the moment, which it is. But in the future, how is it? How does it maintain that? Because eventually, um, there will be, you know, the, one way or another, it's a feeder league. And there's no Indians playing in it. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, th- this is a separate question altogether. Is uh, Indians playing in other leagues or not? Um, I I hope at some point there is a little bit more clarity because I think BCCI and the owners are going to come to a head to it at some point very soon because these owners are going about buying franchises everywhere in the world. Like um, Mumbai Indians have four other franchises apart from Mumbai. They're going to want Indian players to play there and win them their leagues there too. But right now they're not allowed to. At some point, it's going to start mattering And the owners, that's the only time it's going to really be a discussion with the BCCI when the owners bring it up. So this is a separate discussion altogether. I don't think it's going to happen anytime in the next two, three, four years. It's going to continue this way. But hopefully, I want to see Indian players, at least like maybe not the top 10, 15 players, but, you know, uh, players outside of that potentially playing uh, elsewhere so that they can get more reps. They can play in like other environments like in Australia and South Africa, but eventually they'll get to play. It's a really good opportunity for them. So that's one thing. But on the SA T20, I think um, the the IPL is not going to extend backwards. Yep. The IPL is always potentially going to start in end of Feb, March. That's when it's potentially going to start. Because of weather conditions, because of, uh, you know, festivals and things of this nature. And so, therefore, once it starts in February, the December to Feb time frame is still empty. It's still up for grabs. I think the end game for SAT20 is to completely own this time frame. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer. I said that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? Then I don't know desks. I've been using desks for years. I'm a collector of desks, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit. This is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen, and it has under desk cable management. But really, the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button. And it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore. Even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional, adjustable, upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings. The, the biggest issue with that is that the ILT20 is happening at the same time with some of the same owners. And so, you know, there, there will be that. But there, I think there's an element where the SAT20 be, can become like the summer league of the IPL, where essentially, you know, you do send those players over. J- just get back to the Indian players. Buying a, a league in South Africa, um, buying a league in um, uh, West Indies, makes sense from talent development and coaching development and, and brand development situations buying teams in england buying teams in um america buying teams in australia which are all things they've already started with uh america but they've also all looked at trying to get involved with with these other leagues suggest to me that they think eventually they will be able to get their players to play overseas uh-huh. in whichever league that they want right which and and i think the bcci has been laughing at the other boards because of because of everything and they're about to get a very swift understanding of what actual ownership means because you know at, at this stage the ambani's own what almost every major product in cricket they Five, already own six franchises they own forget, six franchises forget the franchises like, like they've got their own streaming platform uh they've got their own fantasy cricket platform uh they will go for the major cricket websites uh very, you know cricket info or cricket buzz will be on their list very very shortly uh they will you know whatever it is they will they're clearly this is their plan to own as much of cricket as possible and they're already arguably yes. more powerful than the bcci in many ways and they're not the only ones right there are other power sh- powerful ownership groups uh within there as well so i i do think that it's going to be and and it's if the BCCI was a brilliantly run organization with cunning people that were all pulling together in the, in the same direction, I'd be like, they've still got a fighting chance. But you know, when it's um when it's old old boy Jay, I don't know if uh, that's quite the, the same level of of tactical thinking on both sides here. So, point being that they're going to have that. So I do think no, there will be right. a point towards that. No, you're right, and it's no surprise that the first 
rumor or like you know the news that came out was uh, Jofra Archer signing with uh, the Mumbai Indians potentially it hasn't happened yet but there's been a bunch of like talk around Jofra Archer signing with all the Mumbai franchises to play all year round and the English cricket team will have to take permission from the Mumbai Indians for him to play for England this was floated it never came to fruition but i think there's a reason why this was floated like this is franchisee model everywhere else in the world this is how it works mm-hmm. and to me like the future is there's going to be cricketers playing franchise cricket predominantly and there's going to be a time frame let's say in like october november and in maybe you know jan and feb that you play country cricket very similar to the epl where there are like yeah you know particular sections of the year that you play country cricket every other time you play international cricket uh you play franchise cricket and what franchise cricket is going to win which part of the year that is still up for debate but what's not up for debate is is country cricket going to win or is franchise cricket going to win there is no question franchise cricket is winning and it is going to continue to keep winning and i'm surprised it took so long in cricket because every other sport is already in this franchise mode cricket got late to the party but it's the same playbook that's happened in all other sports that cricket is now following i i think part of the reason though is that cricket was the one sport that was internationally um dependent right so you know the, the most of those other sports even football we, we know how big the world cup is and everything else but actually football makes the majority of its money on every saturday when teams run out to play right it doesn't make it the majority of its money from from these other events um and dif- different now that the world cup's suddenly a billion dollar you know multi billion dollar thing but but back in the old days you know playing a world cup wasn't where you made your money right you know if if you if you're a national board so yeah it, it it's interesting i i still think that it also allows i don't know what one day cricket fits into this but it also allows for a franchise version of test cricket and first class cricket and whatever that may be a combination of those two things uh to go forward but there is there's no way to put the 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 genie back into the box like once private ownership came into cricket it makes a lot more sense and to go back to why these leagues exist why sri lanka have a league and why bangladesh have a league and why new zealand have a league the idea is that international cricket is a very inconsistent paymaster right so if you don't get india to come and tour you over a period of time you know your your revenue is probably going to be halved for the, for that four year period right if they only come and they play one test because that's all they want to play again you 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 make even less money you make a little bit of money from the english market but there's only up until recently well there's still only two tv companies in england that ever bid for cricket they don't usually push each other all that hard so there isn't anything huge and in australia if you play australia you're pretty much just going after the one cable tv network uh, outside of the ashes to broadcast your cricket so again there's no system where these other teams can make money from international cricket more than they do other than milking their own audiences and if you're in let's just go to new zealand and sri lanka there's no one to milk right there there just aren't that many people there isn't you know the economies don't really back up these sorts of things so the idea being at that stage is well we can have cricket on the tv for every day of the week over a month period follow the big bash model and this is why the big bash essentially exists because of the india series that that ended up being cancelled um not not being cancelled the threat of being cancelled in 2007 8 right and that model makes a lot of sense but what cricket boards and i've had this discussion with cricket boards again and again is they don't seem to understand that their top end is not the same as someone else's top end right and so they never spend appropriately for what their market is because they are trying to spend uh with other with other places so instead of getting small amounts of money and being smart with their money what they try and do is go for these these huge things oh we need we need overseas players in Does the Super Smash need overseas players? Do you need to be paying players one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to come and play in your local tournament? How, does that improve? The, are, are you selling extra tickets? Are you getting extra TV rights for that? My guess is they are not, right? So I don't see why they need to be able to do that. The same with Bangladesh, the same with Sri Lanka, as they all currently stand, right? So again, if they there is an opportunity to run good local competitions that are sustainable that make you consistent small amounts of money that allow you to go on and and then 
do what Iceland did in the football, right? Do what Greece did in the basketball. Occasionally get something right and go on a run in a world championship. But no one wants to do that, Shredder. No one at all. Everyone's like, oh, what if we got Rashid Khan? You, you'll have him for a week. And then he's playing in seven other leagues. Even Rashid Khan's family don't know what league he's playing in. Question question for you. Um, uh, how much money did you think Rashid Khan made last year in 2023? How much money do I think he made or how much money would is publicly accepted? Did he make in 2023? But you're not talking about the kickbacks. You're talking about just like... So no, you know you know that no IPL player is paid. None of those top players are paid what they're getting. Because isn't... Virat Kohli is like the 12th highest paid player in the IPL at the moment. My ass, he is the 12th highest player, <laughs> paid player in the IPL. Um, okay, so if we go right across his board, you're probably looking at about, what, three and a half million should be what he's getting. And it'd be slightly less than that because I'm probably pumping up some of the smaller leagues. So is it about two and a half million? Wow, you're pretty on point, uh, Jared. It's, he, uh, I, I looked at all of the tournaments that he played in 2023. By the way, it's an incredibly hard task to do. Like the Crick Infos and the Crick Buzzes of the world, they don't. You, there's no place that you can go and see Tell me all the tournaments that Rashid Khan played, yeah. how he performed in each of them and how much he made. There's no place to do that. No. So I had to go individually to each of these tournaments and find out he made $3 million last year. Okay. So he made $3 million. Let's put an extra million dollars on top of that from the non-salary cap payments of IPL. But also, <laughs> it's worth noting, that isn't just the IPL. Did he play in the CPL last year? Yes, he did. He certainly got more than was budgeted for the CPL as well then. Um, I don't know about the other leagues, to be fair. So I can tell you this for a fact. So Big Bash do this openly. Other leagues do this quietly. Quite often players get a marketing fee. So, mm. so when you see a player getting paid 250 k in the Big Bash and you're like, oh, that's not too good. Check if there's a marketing fee. Because that marketing fee, you know, KP got a marketing fee. Freddie Flintoff, I think, might have got a... Did Flintoff play in the IPL? Yeah, no. Flintoff played for Chennai actually for a couple of seasons. Warner. Uh, he played. Uh, Warn. Shane Warne got a marketing fee with the Big Bash. Um, when I was with uh, the uh, in the CPL, there were quite a few players that had marketing fees. So that three million is probably closer to four, four and a half million is is my thing. Right. But again, I would say he's the most important player in T Twenty franchise cricket at the moment, and that that is what that's a. I think that's the mid level exception. No, that's less than the mid level exception this in the is, NBA. Th this is exactly the point that I was going to make. Like four and a half million for the most talented cricketer in the world, for how much he's got to travel yep. and figure out which country he's in when he wakes up and what color jersey he's going to wear. He's probably confused the heck out of his mind every day where he lives, what he does. And he makes only four and a half million. Like cricket does not seem like, you know, a rich man sport. I mean, any sport that's in the US will scoff at this if you like worked all year round to make four and a half million dollars to be the best, you know, cricketer on the planet. That doesn't seem right. Something doesn't seem right there. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that a lot of that does come back to all these leagues don't actually make proper money, right? So the even even the IPL, let's be honest, the IPL players are tragically underpaid. And that is yeah. a that is not an opinion that a lot of people like to hear. And and they go, oh, oh well. Or they go, per game, they get paid this. I don't care. Yeah. Have a look how much the BCCI and the owners are making off these franchises. Yeah. The IPL so players the, are massively underpaid. The uh, revenue share with the IPL players is 18, 1.8% of the overall purse of these, uh, um, the, the revenue that the teams make. Yeah. In the EPL, it's 71. In the NBA, it's 50%. Yeah. 18% is, yeah, it's tragically underpaid. Like, uh, I think all of their salaries over the next three, five, eight years when the next set of teams potentially get added, the salary cap is going to spike at some point. Like, And there are going to be some international players who are going to be very happy with it. This is going to happen quite soon. I think. Yeah, but the other thing is that the salary cap in cricket doesn't make any sense anymore because, okay, so so I'm the Ambati family and I want Joffre Archer. I'll pay Joffre Archer a million dollars in the IPL and I'll pay him eight million dollars in 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 other leagues or in promotional things so when i worked for solution <coughs> i became the general manager the first thing i did for enough is i looked at the terms and conditions right i could only pay i can't remember what the top payment was for a player then 150 or 200 thousand dollars and i was like okay so top players are fine i'm assuming the owner will give them a marketing fee or the cpl will give them a marketing fee and they'll top that up 
what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to get the best players on the, I think it was 30, 50, 70, 25. Those were the other contract points. And I was like, how do I make it so that those players are all also top level players, but without paying them? And the first thing I saw in the salary cap was uh, they could just be brand ambassadors for the team for the other 10 months of the year. Right. And I was, and, and I, I was honestly oh so God. shocked. And I was, the journalist in me did something that the general manager in me should not have done. I contacted the CPL and I went, so from what I could tell here, if I want to bring Ruck in Cornwall to St. Lucia for once a week, right, for the next 10, 10 months of the year outside the CPL, I could pay him $50,000 to do that. And they were like, yeah. yeah so, so salary cap in cricket, it, and, and you know why there's a salary cap? It, because it's partially based on the NBA um, and also because people like Dean Kino from Cricket Australia are involved. But it doesn't make any sense. This is much more like um, uh, football, right, at this stage, right? The, and Barnes are going to end up with the best team possible no matter how yeah. because they are going to do that. And then the other this, families as well, or the other groups. This this thing that happened with Pandya, um, <laughs> oh, my God, that was such a joke. Like, I... I was so furious. Like when I woke up, uh, actually, it was uh, we we woke up to the news and then figured out that it might be fake news, which I don't understand for a league like the IPL. Why there is no official kind of reporting on it or whatnot? For three days, it festered without knowing if it's true or not. And then on the third day, finally, I think Pandya sources himself confirmed or whatever the case, but. It was a joke. Like, if I'm Gujarat, I'm thinking, what the hell just happened? Like, who did we get back? Why did we give Pandya here? We just won an IPL and went to the final and almost won the second one. And we just let go of our captain to get back what? Like, it it was a big middle finger to all of the Gujarat fans. I just didn't get, like, what just happened. I still don't. I think there's, like, you know, a very minimal understanding of uh, long-term winning as the most important thing in the IPL. It still seems like short-term, you know, uh, dollar value thinking based uh, decision making as opposed to like building a fan base and a team that's two years old who've actually done really well. Why would they give out their captain? I was so infuriated. It felt like, you know, they're screwing up a product that is doing so well and i don't want the ipl to do that well go through the history of mumbai trades they are almost all football transfers right they yeah. just buy players and teams get so I, I won't i won't name the actual players involved but there was a trade a couple of years ago where what i think it was a couple of years ago it was within the last two or three years i remember that um where mumbai wanted a player and so they paid another team to get the player. And so I knew people inside the franchise that, that and I said to them, well, what's happening here? And they said, yeah, but you know, that two or $300,000 or 500,000 or 100,000, whatever it was that goes towards, and I went, that goes towards nothing. These people are all billionaires, right? That goes really towards nothing. Like, I mean, like, let it be a hundred crores, which is what like, you know, there was a bunch of like, is patchy reporting about the fact that Gujarat got back 100 crores and Gujarat is owned by CVC Capital and they were looking to shore up their year-end finances. I'm like, are you kidding me? CVC Financial is a $50 billion yeah. conglomerate. 100 crores is like peanuts. Like it doesn't make any sense. Like I still don't understand why this happened. And, and so, is- so you get those, those sorts of conversations. I do think you're right. There is a a misund- I think because Indian sport doesn't come from a franchise slash salary cap slash, you know, system. I think there is, especially with the ownership group, just a confusion of what is happening. The lack of a, dr- a proper draft also makes trading very hard. But you, you look at that Hardik thing and you're like, okay, so let's say you're going to put in, I don't know, um, 2 million US dollars into the trade, right? Okay, we will take that and we will use that to shore up our analytics department or a sports science department, which I, I think is what at least one other team um, claimed to have done with their money, right? Fine. You still need to get three players from uh, Mumbai. You need to get one player that destables their team, right? Because you've got to play them. 
right? So you can't allow them to be good. And then you need to get two young players that everyone thinks are going to be up and coming players. And look, they might both be busts, right? It happens in, in other sports all the time. But if you don't do that, all you have done is made a little bit of money and made another team better, right? You, you have obviously, you have the ability to go out on the market and get another player. I understand that part of it, but there isn't another Hardik Pandya. So you're not going to be able to recover the, the, the next Hardik Pandya anyway. Right, and you're probably yeah, Hardik Pandya doesn't grow on trees. Yeah. Like an Indian all rounder of that, like the are you going to go get Ravindra Jadeja? Like that could be an equivalent like replacement. You just don't get these guys, and to sell them for cash is cash going to go play for you in the IPL? It, it made me so furious. Like it, there was such a lack of understanding. I felt like, and uh, or maybe it's about it's not about fandom and winning. That's not the goal. Mm. The goal is like. At this point, like making money from the franchise, that's the goal. Not to build a long-lasting championship pedigree team that continues to win constantly. That is a disturbing thought to me that a franchise owner would think that this is the goal. You know what I mean? Well, I, so I'll take this an, an, another level for you. Essentially, all everything we've talked about today is because of immature thinking. It's because this is happening on the fly. You've got individual boards who are just not re- we're not ready for commercial ownership right you've got cricket australia who have been in this in their mind they've been in this war with india for the last 25 years right of you know politics of on the field of you know all this sort of stuff completely oblivious to the bigger issues that are about to happen to them which is actually they should have been in a war with franchise cricket or been involved with franchise cricket or you know take it a forward step with that you've got english cricket who decided to have its own version of a Premier League and then did it in such a tight-ass way because they suddenly realized halfway through they didn't have any money, right? You, you've got IPL owners who, in many ways, I think you and I think are probably some of the smarter people when it comes to the future of cricket, and yet they cannot even manage their own finances and everything else. You've got underpaid players. You've got smaller cricket boards who don't understand their role in society anymore and are not trying to get the best out of themselves because of that, right? Right. This is a shit show from beginning to end. And that's I, why I you end up it. with five leagues in one section, right? Because the whole thing, no one runs cricket. No one is looking at the overall picture. It is just a bunch of people trying to make short-term games in all these different areas. And then suddenly they just bump into each other like idiots. I I absolutely loved this last 40 seconds that you just did. Because yeah, I um, like it infuriates me as well. Like I would like to speak with the folks in Bangladesh and be like, guys, why would you not do it in October and November? What is your problem? Yep. And same thing with like the NZ smash and be like, can you guys not come together? Like what is up with you guys? And have the discussion with the, you know, why can't Indian players play outside? What happens if Indian players play outside? Like I don't have your like ABC contracts, keep them for India, but the rest of the people can play outside. Like why not? What are we like losing? Oh, oh, one of the league a year. Right, so and and you can't go back to the same league twice, right? So Rohit can play in the major league one year and the ILT twenty another year, or you know, or, or Jadeja can play in the well, Big Bash and the, or the Sri Lankan Premier League one year and and whatever. Do you know what I mean? Allow them that so that they get the experience away from home. There is th- this whole thing of keeping the Indian players in the Indian league is like it doesn't matter. No one is ever going to be able to replicate what India has. Right, America is not going to be able to replicate what India has. England is not going to be able to replicate it. Sure as shit, South Africa and and Sri Lanka are not going to be able to replicate it. Right, so be smart. Right, you've already got the friggin' you know some of your franchises out there. Say to them, okay, uh, you yeah you 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 own this player in the IPL. You get them in one. It's just there just doesn't seem to be any total vision in any way. And so again, it's the same problem that we talk about with what's happened now is. If the franchise, if even the IPL doesn't have a strong, clear vision of what it is and what it should be, it will just keep bumbling along when realistically all these things could be so much better. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would, I, 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 I hope for the IPL's sake, uh, given the fact that India is the richest creating board and the biggest, like, you know, uh, cricket following nation, it, this is the golden goose. Like, this is what you want to be known for. And I hope they don't screw it up. And I hope they stay ahead of uh, 
the competition, they like own that part of the calendar. They expand out a little bit more. I mean, clearly what they are right now, they are the big dog, but you just can't like continue to keep doing the same thing that you're doing and hope that no one else is not going to do anything. Like I just want the IPL to become the, you know, gold class like the NBA is or like the EPL is or, you know, all of these other like big, big, big leagues that there are. Yeah. There's no reason why the IPL should not be this. And like you said, if they just continue to keep bumbling it away like this, yeah, I, I'm worried uh, that and then the the immaturity or the short-sightedness from the owners or the backroom dealings that happen, which makes people from other countries question, is this really what we think is happening? Like these kinds of things also have a chance of derailing what the IPL could be. These are the kinds of things I feel like needs to be you know, brought under control or like thought of in a more long-term success way and not just saying, hey, at the end of this year, how much money are we going to make? Uh, well, just to get back to the, the big dog bumbling around thing, because I think that's really interesting. If franchise cricket is the future, right, the IPL at a certain point has to get its act together and actually run it correctly because otherwise it will affect cricket. If If the IPL is like, three months of the year and has 10 teams and, you know, still doesn't have the best players playing for it because they won't allow Pakistani players in and, you know, they won't have more overseas players in and, you know, all that sort of thing. And everyone's going to be like, oh, yeah, the IPL. Like, if you talk to people in Australia and England and, and um, South Africa and New Zealand, you know, sometimes, and, and even Pakistan, they'll say, yeah, it's a good league and it's probably the best league in the world. But is when the top four teams are playing in the finals, it's still nowhere near the level of a World Cup final. Uh, so the the rest of the competition is probably above the World Cup competition. But when you get to the end, there's a big drop off between the two, right? And that is unquestionably the case, right? That as good of the league as good as this league is, like if you put, I don't know, you know, Milwaukee Bucks or the, or, or the Warriors or the Nuggets into into um, well basketball at the moment, the, America is the only team that would be able to consistently beat them, right? If yeah, you put some yeah, of these yeah. franchise teams into the World Cup. They would struggle to make the semifinals, some of these teams, right? And and, and so there is, it, if it, franchise cricket is going to be the thing, right? It actually has to be the thing. It can't be done half-assed based on political grievances and and on small-mindedness and on, oh, we need more Indians in the team. Eventually, there's going to be more Indians in the team anyway. As I said, it wouldn't even surprise me if teams eventually have all Indian lineups at times, you know, maybe with one overseas star because they can't find a a wrist spinner or, you know, a fastball or a a slogger or something like that, right? Those things will happen naturally. You don't have to hide it away. You did when you started. You had to, you had to, because in 2008, you had to suck up to the nationalists a little bit and be like, no, this is going to help. No, no one cares about that anymore. The IPL is bigger than that now, right? Like it either ha- if franchise cricket is going to work, we need one franchise that becomes MLB, you know, Premier League or Champions League or you know or whatever it may be, the NBA level. And if not, then we've given up international cricket for little chunks of stuff that everyone can't. No one, everyone goes, oh yeah, I kind of like that league, but I don't like that league, and I don't watch it that much anymore. Like I, I just don't see how that helps the game either. Now, yeah, um, I I agree with you. Um, I, it infuriates me that, uh, I learned when I was like trying to learn more about the South African T20 that Pakistan players are not allowed in the South African T20 because all six franchises are owned by Indian owners there, IPL owners there. And I was like, that makes no sense. You know, they're playing in South Africa. They're not even playing in India. I'm like, why would Pakistan players not be allowed in the SAT 20? Like, there are some ridiculous things that are happening. Uh, this, like, Pakistan players not being allowed and Indian players not being allowed to play elsewhere. Only four, like, uh, internationals. All of these, like, you know, cold start problems. Yeah. I feel like need to, you know, kind of, uh, like you said, be eased out. And the merit kind of play its part. Because I think there's enough talent now in India, in the rest of the world, where the salary cap is set for a reason. Mm. With that salary cap, you can only buy maybe so many foreign players. And merit is automatically going to define who's going to be your 11. We don't need to do all of these like shenanigans to you know retrofit 
uh, four uh, internationals only, not allow Indians to go elsewhere. All of these kinds of things are starting to get a little dumb, I feel like. Yeah, it, it, it goes back to, I think you said the cold start problems, which I really like, but it just goes back to it. Cricket small thinking. Do you know what I mean? Rather than just be like, uh, this should just be bigger. It should be. It should be an explosion onto cricket. And I think that's kind of where it has to go. Um, but that's it. I won't make you yell about cricket anymore. And I won't yell at you about it anymore. Uh, but thank you very much for coming on the podcast. And your podcast is called? Yeah, mine's uh, Conversations at Cow Corner. Uh, we talk about the cricket and the business uh, behind cricket. And uh, we've just, we're just getting started. Uh, we're going to do an IPL special. Hopefully something that uh, you know I'm very excited about. Hopefully the listeners are as well. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks, Jared. Nice chatting with you. Thanks to the kind folks at FlexiSpot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their E7 Pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button. You don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro Chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today.